Good evening everyone and thank you for joining the Forecasting Australia's Livestock Future webinar. There's still quite a few participants looking to log in. I'm Nathan Jennings from North Coast Local Land Services and I'll be one of your hosts along with Max Newsom from Northern Tablelands Local Land Services. Good evening Max. Good evening Nathan, thanks for having me. It's good to see so many people joining us this evening. Um, there's a lot going on in this space at the moment and I'm very keen to see what Simon has to say. I'd now like to hand it over to Simon. Great. Well, um, thank you everyone for attending. Um, and uh, dare I say, these are monumental times and occasions. Um, whether it's African swine fever, whether we're talking COVID-19, or whether we're talking about meatworks being banned from shipping to China. That's all on the discussion table for tonight. And I would really like to encourage everyone um, to participate in, um, in asking questions. So as we said, there will be a um, halfway point in which to um, ask questions and, uh, and then we'll go from there. Um, as I said, um, welcome to tonight and um, we'll get into the thick of things straight away here. So. Right now, Australia has the most expensive feeder steers in the world. And for some, that's uh, no surprise, particularly if you've read Beef Central, um, in which I uh, wrote an article in the last week or so. But um, you know, we'll talk about that as well as the current situation on cattle, lambs, and currency, because they're all three very important things to get a snapshot as of today. But looking at um, where we sit, Australia, in terms of record um, steer prices, in comparison to our competitors, and by that I mean um, Brazil, Uruguay and Argentina, we're currently sitting about 75% above the value of Argentinian and Brazilian cattle as we speak. Uruguayan cattle, we're 31% above, and US cattle, 3% above. That remarkable fall there that you see in US prices has been brought upon by COVID-19, in which kills in North America on beef have fallen in the last three to four weeks by 40% across the country. So you can imagine 40% of capacity gone in Australia. That would be the equivalent of losing JBS and Cargill together in the marketplace. And so the impact has been quite dramatic in terms of cattle prices in North America. So as a result of, you might say, market failure in North America, lo and behold, we have stepped forward as the number one country in the world in terms of feeder prices. The fact that we've had a devastating drought has been a huge part of that, and we're currently in the process of beginning a rebuild. So there are a lot of factors driving why Australia's feeder steer prices are high, but it's important to understand that rel in relative terms, we are, it's, it's, it's a struggle to be competitive when prices are this high. So just a snapshot of where we stand today on Australian cattle prices, heavy steers, feeder steers and cows, this is uh, the pricing that's based off the new COVID-19 pricing that MLA has put in place, and that is because of the restriction to access to sale yards. So we saw the peak in the market in, in the last few months on March the 12th, in which feeder steers got to 405, heavy steers got to 341, and cows got to 268 AC a kilo live weight. The equivalent of the EYCI, which is one of the indicators we're all familiar with, was on March the 12th, it got to 765. The previous high before that was 725 back in October 2016. When looking at some of my previous predictions, so joining us tonight are people from the Northern Tablelands, from the North Coast, of New South Wales. We've also got people from WA and, and pretty well all over Australia. 
So back in November 2018, I was fortunate enough to be vi visiting the people in the Tablelands. I gave five workshops across the region, and I came up with many forecasts at the time. Um, for some, it was um, they were revelations, you might say, in that I was predicting some fairly bullish prices for the following two years, with the caveat that we had drought and the need to get through the drought, of course. So was I right back in 2018 in November? I made the forecast then that in 2020, we would get to 750 on the, uh, on the Eastern Young Cattle Indicator. And as I said, on March the 12th, we got to 765. So in the eyes of some, maybe I wasn't as good as I predicted in terms of we, uh, we've overshot the market, but I don't think anyone will be complaining. So that was one of the predictions, and we'll go through these predictions so that um, I can put my, um, uh, I guess, legitimacy on the table or take it off the table. So when we look also now at the Australian lamb and mutton prices that currently exist, the high once again was March the 12th. We saw lambs get to 960, and we saw um, sheep mutton prices get to 744. AC a kilo. Since then, the market has fallen about 15%. So what did I predict back in November 2018? I was looking for the, a price on lambs to get around $8 a kilo. But a lot of my work I do based on international markets. So that was done in US cents per kilo at 600 cents. Well, what I didn't know is that the Australian dollar would fall from 74 cents down to 64 cents and lower. We've seen 58 and thereabouts. So in real terms, in actual fact, the high of 966 or 960 that we saw came up as 602 US cents per kilo. So I wasn't correct in terms of my Aussie dollar price, AC a kilo. But in terms of US cents a kilo, I was out by two US cents a pound. Now, I realized tonight in Walker that there are a number of people that have gone back through the notes that were kept from November 2018. So I appreciate I'm under a great deal of scrutiny right now, but I'm quite happy with that and uh, look forward to their questions when it comes to question time. So let's talk about the other crazy predictions that I made in November 2018 while touring the Northern Tablelands. Firstly, that the Eki would get to 750. 765 has been achieved. That lamb would get to 600 US cents a kilo. We've got to 602. That in June 2019, that the Eki would get to 570 to $6. Well, I fell short there. We got to 534 AC a kilo in July, and it retreated because the drought got so severe. I said, when the drought breaks, cow prices will rise in the first five months by 25 to 50%. And that's yet to be seen because, in my eyes, the droughts probably really started to break up in late March and April. And for some, they're still waiting for the drought to break. But I'd like to say on the whole that um, a good portion of the eastern seaboard, I'd like to say the drought is broken. In Western Australia, it's quite different. I also then laid claim to that the EYCI cattle prices in January next year will get to um, 800 cents per kilo. The high so far has been 765. I said African swine fever at the time would claim 100 million hog losses in China in 2019. Well, I fell well short of the mark there. It's more like 220 million head of hogs have been lost in the last year. At the time, uh, ASF, it was November, and August was when it was first announced in China. So we were around three months into it, and at that point, the amount of information coming out of China was almost non-existent. 
And in terms of globally understanding about the disease, I am one or two others were one of the few people truly writing about it every week. Lastly, I said China beef input imports in 2019 would increase by 113% because of those losses in China due to hogs. In actual fact, we were up 90% in 2019. I'm not sure if that was on a scorecard how I would fare, but as I said, I look forward to the questions. So a critical part of all this and is, is currency. Currency in terms of how cheap those Brazilian cattle are, how cheap the Argentinian cattle are, and also just how um, competitive those countries are against us in terms of export prices. So here's a chart of currencies of where we fit Australia against our major competitors as equally important where we fit with regards to our major buyers. And so you can see the Aussie dollar there is at 19, not, minus 19%. It's sitting about fifth down in the, in the list. So as a supplier, you want to be as far down that list as possible because that's how you're more competitive the lower you are in relative terms to the US dollar. What you want, though, is America sits at the very top, and as our export or our demand markets should sit below America in between us and America, that's to our advantage because effectively we're far more competitive into those countries than America is based on currency. So the Korean won, for example, is down 13.7%. That makes us far more competitive based on currency than North America. The Indian rupee 12%, the yuan into China at minus 10.8%. But I think what's frightening here is you look at the Argentinian peso, which is at minus 70%. Now, I, it's so low, I didn't even include it here because it would have thrown my graph out too dramatically. The Brazilian real at minus 41%. So they are extraordinarily low currencies as a result of the trade war, and I guess COVID-19 has, has pushed it even lower. But when you think about China, which is the number one market for beef in the world, and 78% of their imports come from South America, and we supply just 11% of the total imports into China. 78% are coming from currencies that on average are 45% below the US dollar compared to us at 19%. It's just a stark reminder how important currencies are and also how competitive our South American competitors are against us because of a low currency. So what has been the impact of Australia's drought? How much damage has really been done? And I would say significant damage. Let's look at the Australian rainfall. Back in December, it was dry everywhere. And by the time we got to April, the eastern seaboard is looking in good shape. But in reality, the west of Australia is not looking brilliant. So here's just a quick sketch of pasture growth. As you can see in December, it was arid. It, it looked terrible. And as we get into the month of April, that eastern seaboard has really rebounded very quickly. And in particular, New South Wales and southeast Queensland has been very, very responded to the rains, along with Victoria. There are still parts that are worrying in, in eastern Victoria, Gippsland region, East Gippsland. There's been some real concerns still there. And in parts of central and western Queensland, it's still dry. But the west coast of Australia is a particular concern. So when we look at just the pasture growth, we find that as I said, in the West, it's been dry. And we saw in the last four months, 726,000 head of livestock move from the West of Australia to the East. 
Now, they were incentivised for two reasons. One, that groundwater is very, very um, lacking, you might say, in, in western, southern western Queens, um, Western Australia. And they desperately need water. And also, feed is short. But on the east coast, we've got the complete opposite because we've decimated our herd, we've decimated our flock, and so rising cattle and sheep prices, lamb prices, have brought those animals across along with spare capacity that we've got in terms of the um, uh, meat works in, on the eastern seaboard. So when you break up the, the four months of um, movements from west to east, 384,000 were lambs, 312,000 were sheep, and only 30,000 or so were cattle in that four-month period of, of this year. They're pretty startling figures, and it tells you just how dry things are on the West Coast. So what's the damage we've seen? Well, I've, what I've put in front of you here is the previous three droughts in Australia, 2002 to 3, 2014, 15, 2009 and 10. And this is the drought of all droughts. And we have been above around about 52% and above for almost 11 months, which is phenomenal. Never have we seen that before. And as a result, the expectation is, I think, that we've reduced our cattle herd by around to about 24 million head, which you know only five years ago was sitting at around 28 and a half million head. And we've seen the Australian flock, I believe, now below 60 million. And I realize that MLA has slightly higher numbers than that, but I truly believe that we, that in particular, the tail end of this drought was appalling and it had a sting in it that I think is going to kind of have repercussions in terms of supply for several years to come. So just quickly looking at Queensland, it started to come back into line where it should at 45.5% female of the kill ratio. But for, a, for rebuild to really start to develop, it has to go below that dotted line there on average sits, I believe, at around about 43.5% for Queensland. That dotted line represents the, the point of equilibrium in the herd, and below that, the rebuild begins. And I think we'll find that this April number and May will be dramatically different when, when those figures come out from the ABS. And the same holds for New South Wales. At 51.7% back in March, we were still liquidating the herd. Those signs of good rain were coming in late March and in April. And as I said, the expectation is that we're going to go below the dotted line in, in the next coming months as we desperately try to rebuild the herd. So has the drought broken? And I believe it has. And what I've done here is I looked at 120 years of data. And in that data, I looked at the nine driest years apart from 2019. And over that 120 years, when you averaged out those nine extreme dries, you come up with an average. And every time a dry year like that occurs, the drought breaks. So it has two successive years of wet years. And my point here is history I believe is repeating itself. And 2019 was the driest year on record, and lo and behold, we are, I believe, breaking the drought right now. We're in for a wet year this year, and I believe if history continues to repeat itself, we'll see a wet year next year as well. Two years. So in terms of where we're at in rainfall, it normally, at the moment, we're at about 40% of what should have fallen in um, across the eastern seaboard for Australia. So we've got, if you've had 200 mils so far, expect another 300 mils to come for the rest of the year, if history repeats itself. So 
And the second point out of this is that consistently over those nine extreme dries we looked at in the 120 years, the first year the wet season came a month or so late. In the second year, the wet season comes a month and a half early. So once again, I'm putting a stake in the ground when we go through these forecasts and say, I'm basing a lot of my views on the fact that we're in for two wet years and we're in for a wet uh, northern summer that's going to come a month to a month and a half early um, the coming season. So the Australian cattle sheep flock. It's now 24 million head. It's at a 27-year low. The flock, I believe, to be low 60 million. Restockers, record prices are driving the market today, and we've seen the Eki at 765. It's retreated, but uh, I believe we're going to revisit these levels in the near future. Production and slaughter will fall sharply in 2020. We're expecting it to be down at least 20%. We're expecting exports to be down 20%. And our key competitors will be looking closely at what we do in Japan and Korea. And we will be down into North America in terms of lean beef over the next 12 to 24 months. So the key factors that will drive the cattle and sheep meat prices for 2020 and 2021. African swine fever being the first. COVID-19, supply disruptions, demand disruptions, but I believe green shoots are now appearing in demand around the world. And we're going to discuss all of these over the next 45 minutes. African swine fever. So, our latest outbreak in African swine fever occurred last week in India. It's in two, two states in northeast India, um, one in Assam and the other one is called Aranche Pradesh. India has about nine million pigs. And what this shows you also is just how close African swine fever has got to Australia. Back in March, we saw that it was found in Papua New Guinea. And if you look at the distance in terms of how the crow flies, that's only 550 kilometres from Australia. East Timor, it's also present. That's 700 kilometres away. When you look at the entire um, presence of African swine fever across Asia, it's now present in 13 countries. And those countries, based off a 2017 baseline, had 532 million hogs in them. We know that it's been in China now since August 2018, been in Vietnam since February 2019. And I can say with confidence that in the majority of these countries, the expectation is for losses to be somewhere around 50 to 60%. I think the only exception will be South Korea, which has shown a, an ability in which to control the disease to a certain extent. So when you look at that figure overall, we're talking close to 255 million hogs that will be lost either in the last 12 months or in the next 12 months. That type of deficit is going to create a global protein shortage and already has. And we've seen that in China in terms of the enormous imports that have been going on in the last 12 months. So a quick update on China. The hog market is still incredibly firm. It's averaging 34.3 renminbi per kilo. Prices, I guess, are up dramatically and still hover at 500% above US hog prices. And we expect that these prices in China are going to remain this firm for the rest of 2020. The Chinese government is desperately trying to keep these prices down and have been releasing frozen stocks out of storage over the last 12 months. But in recent 
weeks, it's been quite dramatic. And as you can tell, since February, there've been the slide in prices from around about 40 RMB per kilo. That has been driven by frozen stocks. That has been the main part of that. And there is a finite limit to those frozen stocks. And the role of beef and sheep meat, as well as imported pork, but beef has been surprisingly the key filler in that market, much more so than what chicken has been. So then let's talk about the supply gap that we're seeing here. Effectively, we've got a 24.5 million tonne supply gap of protein in China. If you increase all the imports of beef, all the imports of chicken, all the imports of, of sheep meat, plus increase their own production to try and match that deficit, we still believe there's around about a 17.5 million tonne deficit each year for the next three years. So let's now talk about COVID-19 and its impact. So I wrote this back on March the 11th, which was in some respects seems like a lifetime ago, but in actual fact it's, uh, it's only just two months ago, and said until a vaccine is found, seasonal disruption to both supply and demand markets in both the northern and southern hemispheres could become an ongoing problem for many years. This will create opportunities for packing and processing facilities who remain free of COVID-19. And to me, that sums up a lot of what we've already been seeing in North America, in Brazil. We've had an outbreak in cedar meats down in Melbourne. But it's all about the disruption to demand and the disruption to supply and what that is doing around the world in terms of key markets that we deal in. So we're going to discuss those over the next five or ten slides. So seasonal considerations of COVID-19. If the virus slows in warmer temperatures, and this is a belief that as the northern hemisphere moves into their summer, we'll start to see the infection rates fall away naturally as Mother Nature does her own thing. 88% of the world lives in the Northern Hemisphere. And the challenge is that 95% of beef imports out for China come from the Southern Hemisphere. And as we move into our winter months, we are expecting that the flu season will get worse. So the end result is that we could see an improvement in demand in the Northern Hemisphere over the next six months. And we could see increased disruptions in the Southern Hemisphere as more and more COVID-19 infections occur in meatworks across Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, New Zealand, Australia, the whole lot. So the answer to me is remaining COVID-19 free and you have a distinct market advantage. Disruption to demand. So what we've seen due to COVID-19 is disruption to demand. Effectively, we've seen market failure. And in my 30 years of trading, I've not seen market failure like this ever before. Food service, which is restaurants, casual eating, um, dining places, fast food outlets, you name it, that makes up 50% or thereabouts of global consumption of beef. In pork, it's around about 25%. And in the lamb industry, I believe it sits around about 35 to 40%. So it's absolutely critical in terms of particularly selling items like the middle cuts. So that's the sloin, the tenderloin, the cube roll, rumps. You know, So they're items that traditionally go into food service. And in addition for sheep, 
you're looking at uh, things like the rack um, that is important, French racks, etc. So all these items have struggled. Literally, these markets have shut down overnight, and as a result, we've seen for Australia some dramatic impacts on the market. One of the concerns in America right now is high unemployment. I believe today it is sitting at 25% due to COVID-19, due to the closure of a lot of businesses, no different to Australia, except they don't have JobKeeper like we have. And what I've highlighted here is one of the potential headwinds, that when you get high unemployment, in North America, you get a, a, effectively a downturn in meat consumption, whether it's pork, chicken, or beef. But right now, the value of beef sits dramatically higher than the value of pork and chicken by two and a half times in the US market. So they're one of the real concerns is that with high unemployment, both not just in North America, but around the entire world, that people will look for cheaper alternatives than eating beef and, and lamb should they outprice ourselves. So what are the hardest industries hit with the food service sector? And it's mind-blowing once you start realizing how important it is. Hotel industries, rely; the food service relies heavily on them. With no travelers, they've shut down. The airline industry, has shut down globally. Movie theaters have shut down. And all these places have restaurants and, and food um, uh, places to eat at that are literally no longer open. Live entertainment, sport, cruise lines. That's a critical um, outlet, particularly in North America, for lamb, but also for tenderloins, strip loins, chilled beef. Then you've got theme parks, gyms, the list goes on and on. And we've had one major casualty in this part of the world, and that is in New Zealand. Burger King went into receivership around about six weeks ago. That is the New Zealand Burger King. And that was a result that in New Zealand, under their very strict level four restrictions, all fast food outlets were shut completely. That was a consequence of that. So just a quick visual. Here are the problems when you have um, COVID-19 impacting places like China. First of all, you have issues with just simply getting the product um, into ports. So we had closures. We also saw this in North America about four weeks ago, where getting access into freezers was difficult. Containers in, in China were piling up on ports. It was difficult to get inspections. It was difficult to get transport. Factories were shut down. Meat processing facilities were shut down. And then you had the restaurant industry shut down as well. It was a disaster. And I'd like to say we're through the worst of it. February really was the ultimate in terms of what happened in China. And I'd you know, we're right in the thick of it in terms of the um, how bad it is in North America as we speak. So what's been the impact here in Australia? Well, because 70% of what we produce goes export, these are the items that have come back onto the Australian domestic market because it's, they simply can't be sold in other places. So we've had rumps fall by 33% compared to what they were before COVID-19. Strip loins fall 44%. Cube rolls 26%. And tenderloins almost 60%. Lamb racks have fallen 30%. And interestingly enough, ground beef is up because that's through retail outlets. And there is a real desire for that cheaper end of the market with so much uncertainty. It freezes well, it's easy to handle, and that has been where the real demand has been. So we've seen a 36% increase in mince 85 CL and in diced beef around about 
if we were to talk about Wagyu, the figures would look even more dramatic in terms of that fall in prices as they've been forced back onto the Australian domestic market because there simply isn't a home for them elsewhere in the world. So the US though is quite unique and that is because the food service sector did shut down. But what happened was that the retail sector expanded and took additional beef and lamb. Um, but what we saw was a several phases in, in the last two months. We saw panic buying that we experienced here in March and it was almost at the same identical time and prices picked up dramatically, around about 30% at the time. Then you had the collapse of the food service sector. And I apologize, that should read retail sector collapse, it should read food service collapse. And then as COVID-19 started to take its toll on workers throughout the meat industry in America, the supply became so tight that even though food service was shut down, but there just wasn't enough supply to meet the retail needs. So effectively, we had 40 to 50 percent closure. We had retail expanding slightly, 50 to 60 percent, and we had supply being restricted by 40 percent. And as a result, prices in America have gone through the roof. But it hasn't been without its cost, and that is that we've had a dramatic fall in cattle prices across America, around about 20%. So at this point in time, I'll stop Nathan and, um, and Max, and let's ask some questions from the audience. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Simon, there's a question that came through fairly early. Uh, what would you expect the price differential to be under more normal trading conditions? And that was probably from one of your um, first couple of slides. So um, what would I, it's difficult to know which differential they're referring to. Um, can we be a little bit more specific, please? We'll see if that person um, puts a bit more information in. Another one um, that's come through, Simon, um, the switch from food service to home consumption, assuming people still eat as often as they normally do, do you think it's a reduction in wastage that saw such a drop in the market or do people just not cook as much meat at home? Well, I think that what we've seen is, is an expansion in the retail sector of, say, 10 to 15, maybe even 20%. Um, but there's no doubt that there's a change in terms of what you eat. So when you go out to a restaurant, you are eating the more expensive end of the, of the animal, and, and we call those the middle cuts. So the strip loin, the tenderloin, the cube roll, and that is, you know, you're sitting at a white tablecloth restaurant, you're paying good money for that. When you're eating at home, it's more the comfort food that people tend to eat. And so that is more the um, lower end of the animal, you might say. And we've seen in Australia the availability of strip loins, tenderloins, etc., being sold a lot more at the retail end. But it's not making up for that lost ground that we've seen um, through the food service sector. So to answer your, your question, um, it's not so much that people are eating less, but they're eating something different. They're eating. Um, what I would say, the comfort food. So minced meat is a very good example where it can be stored easily, frozen well, and, and it can be made into a multitude of dishes. Um, and you know, so this, that's just one of many, many examples. Thanks, Simon. So coming back to that first question, um, they were referring to the slide with the comparison between South America and the US, so the price differential in normal trading gotcha. conditions. Okay, there. so in normal trading conditions, North America would sit well above even Australia, and you can see from that graph, and, and we can go back to it later. But you know, without the um, 
the impact of COVID-19, um, you know, you would have seen probably um, a lot more, I guess, uh, a greater differential between North America and Brazil and Argentina. And we, Australia, I think, would be much cheaper than North America as a result. Keeping in mind that currency plays, as I said, a huge role in terms of overall cheapening the value of those cattle, and that includes us as well. I mean, we're sitting here today at 64.5 cents on the Australian dollar, and still we're more expensive than US beef. There's quite, a few coming There's quite a few coming through, but we might take one more just for now. Simon, um, how critical do you believe chilled product at the supermarket offering opposed to frozen product availability? Sorry, how important is chilled, did you say? Or critical, but, or critical, but possibly important. Yeah, I, I think the chilled market is critical um, in terms of developing overseas markets and both within Australia as well. But we are looking to expand that every day of the week, um, you know, as exporters. So I think the growth of that chilled market, whether we're talking North America, Japan, the US and China, which is, you know, I guess one of the tragedies of the last few days is the, um, is the banning of these four meatworks. But that's where we see real opportunity in driving, I guess, those um, food service items is as chilled and that is one of the tragedies right now with the failure of food service is that our chilled trade is suffering dramatically because of that because a lot of that chilled or that food service goes out as chilled. Okay, will we keep moving ahead then Nathan? I think we can for now and um, if the Guests would like to keep their questions coming through. We will be logging them and we'll have further sure. questions okay. at the end. So let's now talk about disruption to supply. So as we said, we've got four Australian meat plants who now have lost access to China. And this has happened in the last 24 hours. So what we know to date is that they it was an issue supposedly to do with labelling and documentation. The meat, the meat that's already left, that's on the water, seems to be okay. What's unclear is whether this is a short-term or long-term problem. In the market, we're hearing rumours. Um, I actually spoke to one of the, um, the uh, facilities today myself. Um, you know, the best case scenario is this issue is resolved in seven days. I heard from a journalist that they t said it was a six, sorry, a 30-day ban yesterday, and then today I heard it was a 90-day ban. And the truth is, no one really knows. And that within China itself, one department will tell you something completely different from another department. So. Confusion is probably the best way to describe what the status is of those four meat plants right now. So let's look at 2017 as the, I guess, precedent. And in 2017, we had six plants that were banned for six months. And the reason, once again, was due to labelling. Of those six plants, three are here today as part of this. So they are, three of these plants, unfortunately, are experiencing the problem twice. But these four plants are absolutely critical when it comes to grain-fed exports into China. So last year, Australia shipped around about 75,400 metric tonnes of grain-fed beef into China. And I believe those four plants make up close to 50% of those exports. Of overall exports to China, we shipped 300,000 tonnes, and they would have made up close to 30% of those exports. This year, we were on track to sell $3.5 billion worth of beef 
into China. And I can tell you now, we are not going to reach that goal um, because of these um, the banning that we've seen. So I guess we can chat more later on about that and have more questions. Um, but to date, as of about 5 o'clock this afternoon, that's about the most up-to-date information I have. So supply, U.S. supplies declines, plants, slowdowns and closures. U.S. beef production is down 32% last week, and the previous week it was 40%. U.S. pork production is down 34% last week, and once again the previous week actually was down 45%. It's led to retail shortages, as we spoke about, and price surges in North America. Here's a snapshot of what that production looks like. And it's traumatic when you see it you know, on graphs like this. As I said, we've just had a small turnaround. And that tells you that at the meat plants across America, they're starting to get it hopefully under control. As of about three or four days ago, there were 30 plants over the last four weeks that in some form or another have stopped production because of COVID-19. So it is right across America, right across pork, beef and poultry. The impact has been dramatic in terms of retail and wholesale prices in North America, as we've discussed. The beef cutout is up 112%, and the pork cutout cutout is up 118% in the last 30 days. And just to explain what cutout is, if you imagine wholesale prices of every individual item that you sell out there and you glued them all back together into the carcass and added up their relative values, that's what the cutout is. So as I said, 112% and 118% increase. So, Today, these figures came out that the prices paid by the US consumer for food at the grocery stores jumped 2.6% for the month of April. Now, in relative terms, that may not seem like much, but in real terms, that's the biggest one month increase since 1974. I'm betting a lot of the listeners tonight weren't even born at that point in time. So I've Put on the table here just a couple of key items. Here you've got peeled knuckles, which is a fairly common item that's sold, I would call it a commodity item, that in the last month or so has risen 136%. And I can show you a dozen items that look identical to that graph. So here's the tenderloins. And remember the figures that we had for Australia where tenderloins had fallen 60% in value. So you've got that first decline there on the right-hand side of that graph where the food service had fallen so dramatically. But at the same time, if you look at those kill figures that had fallen as well, we've now got supply can't even meet the small amount of retail that tenderloins are sold through. And as a result, we've got that enormous 130% rise in the last two to three weeks. That graph epitomizes the market and how extraordinary things are in North America compared to Australia. So here are the US cattle prices. And on the right hand side there, I've got just a comparison. This should make most of the listeners feel good about themselves. While America's been feeling the pain since January of a 20% fall in cattle prices. In Australia, if we looked year on year, we've got steer prices up 24%, heavy steer prices up 11%, and year on year cow prices up 39%. So spare a thought for your counterparts in North America. They are not happy campers at the moment. So what's the net effect when you've got falling cattle prices in North America and you've got rising beef prices? 
someone's making some money and it's the US processor right now. And in the last week, they made 1500 US dollars per head. That is extraordinary. These are prices as in profits never ever seen before in the North American market. And it's simply because there's that construct, that restriction of processing going on and the cattle cannot be killed. So they're backing up through the system. And it's believed that right now there's about 600,000 head backed up through the entire US cattle system. And by in the next two weeks, that will have amounted to around about 1.5 million head. No wonder cattle prices are falling. And in the meantime, we've got skyrocketing prices all over America. And processes are making good money as we speak. So what's going on with other global suppliers? What other disruptions? And we know that it's happening across Spain, Germany, Ireland, Australia, we've seen it down in, in Victoria. People are testing positive. In Brazil, tonight, I think 850 deaths were recorded overnight in Brazil. And yet, many of these countries are lifting restrictions. And as I said earlier, to me, we're talking about the Southern Hemisphere and about disruptions and about the problems that's going to create with supply as potentially the Northern Hemisphere moves into its summer and demand picks up. So, two models. How can we avoid this in Australia? We Do we want the, the chaotic um, ad hoc approach of North America? And that's probably the only way you could describe it. Or you've got the extreme other version of events, which is New Zealand, which introduced mandatory manning levels of two metres apart back in late March. And as a result, New Zealand has only had two cases of COVID-19 in their meatworks. And it's an extreme example where we've got thousands of workers in North America getting COVID-19 and we've had two cases in New Zealand. And one is because New Zealand forced a mandatory manning levels within their plants. And they tied in their JobKeeper program to get that done. In North America, it's far more chaotic. What we saw, though, in New Zealand is that production fell 32%, and it happened across the board. In America, we've got 36% fall as well. So once you go around the world and look at all the different methods of control, it seems that there's a common element that when COVID-19 is at its worst, about a 30% cut in production tends to get it under control. And it can either done, be done in a more chaotic way or in a very structured way like New Zealand has done. So green shoots are appearing. Demand is starting to, to turn globally. And there's a good reason for that. So we're just going to touch on the reasons now. SARS and the bounce back effect. There's been a recent report by the IMF. We've now got what I believe is a supply driven market as opposed to a demand driven market. We've got um, global COVID-19 restrictions lifting and we've got supply getting tighter out of Australia and the US through our feedlot sector. And we're going to touch on all of those very quickly. So let's talk about the bounce back effect. So after every pandemic over the last 20 years, and SARS back in 2002 and three, we had um, MERS back in 2014, there is what is called the bounce back effect. So if you follow your eye along that blue line there, you will find that, that like any other um, uh, pandemic, they had their panic buying during that initial period. And then as people get concerned about their employment, about the uncertainty about the future, they pull back. And then once the, the um, infection rate starts to fall away, you get that bounce back effect, which is what happened 
in the third quarter of um, 2003. And so if you see that the blue line continues to fall right at the back end there, what it doesn't tell you is that these this is through the retail sector and there's this transition across into the food service, into super, uh, sorry, into restaurants and fast food outlets, etc. So the bounce back effect, it's genuine, it's real. It happened months after SARS did in 2003. And MERS, it took more like 12 months for it to occur, in, in, and that occurred in South Korea. So there's genuine examples through time that we can look at this, and I believe we're more on track for a six-month bounce-back effect here. Let's talk about the IMF report. So they have come out now with figures for global growth at negative 3% for 2020. Keep in mind that you know they were back in January talking about a 3.3% increase or um, world growth for this year. So they've dramatically reversed their view because of COVID-19. But their outlook for 2021 is amazing. It's 5.8%. So they've gone from having an initial outlook for 2021 of 3.4% to now 5.8%. And that is the bounce back effect that's built into that. But I think there's a really important footnote to add to these figures. And that is the underlying assumption that a vaccine is found in the meantime. That by the time 2021 comes around, we've got a commercial vaccine available worldwide. Otherwise, that growth figure will not occur if there is no vaccine next year. So just a quick snapshot of all the players part of that IMF forecast. And the one to look at mostly here is China at 9.2% next year. So it's critical. It is the engine room of growth for next year, followed by Indonesia, um, India is in there, Argentina, Australia is pretty high as well. So it's really important, and that is why I guess it's so bitterly disappointing about the four plants that have been banned yesterday, because next year is so important to have access into China to take advantage of that 9.2% growth. So let's hope they're back on track next year. So. Here we are, we're in 2020. In the last three weeks, I've been trading meat into North America. And we had prices three weeks ago, trading at around 220 US cents a pound SIF. Today, that same meat, item of meat, was now trading at 240. So in three weeks, we've had a 10% rally in, in 90 CL, which Meat. And we're starting to see all the benefits of that tight supply in North America starting to come or be made available to countries like Australia and New Zealand. So this is very much like what went on in 2014, whereby the market went into what was a supply-driven market. And by that I mean the lack of supply. Because in 2014, the US herd got to 89 and a half million, which was something like a 63 year low. And as a result, there simply wasn't enough meat in the system. And right now, we're experiencing the same thing. There just isn't enough meat in the system. Back in 2014, production fell from that previous year by 5.75%. So let's now look then at today's latest figures by the USDA in what's called the WASD report. And they have revised their figures dramatically on US beef production for this year. And it's a stark turnaround. They've now removed 762,000 metric tons out of their production forecast. And so now we're back to a five and a half 
5% reduction on 2019. That is looking very much like, as I said here, the 5.75% reduction that actually occurred. So now you can start to see that these traders that we talk to and end users who basically are saying even before these figures were put out, this market feels like 2014 and that's the reason why. We've also got pork production that's going to be almost at minus 0.7% and from being in an extraordinary oversupply situation on pork, we're now into an undersupply situation. And I think what's critical about pork is that we've seen with the hogs that they have started to euthanize hogs in North America. And so we're going to see next year that there isn't going to be that drag on effect of those hogs being carried over. I think they've just been taken out of the system. And so the figures are not as dramatic as what beef will be for next year. So the issue is they kick the can down the road here that that 600,000 to 1.5 million head I spoke of has now been transferred into 2021. And it begs the question, are we going to see falling prices next year in North America? And that's a big question that we will talk more about next week when we get right into the thick of these forecasts because these figures have just come out today and I'd like to look at them a little bit closer but they have kicked the can down the road here and so now we've got 6.7 percent increase and the question is are all those other positive factors going to outweigh the negative um, in terms of extra production for next year so we have got lifting of global not COVID-19 restrictions globally and it's really important to understand why these or how these restrictions are going to be lifted because as exporters, we can then start to plan around markets and when they're going to lift. So in North America, we've got 16 states that have lifted. We've got eight pending and 27 in lockdown. Those 27 is where the population lie. That is where the density is. In Asia, three countries have lifted, China, Vietnam and South Korea. Seven countries are in full or partial lockdown. In Europe, 10 countries have lifted. And you've got France, who's delayed all the way back to July 24th. Australia, Victoria is one of the few places that haven't lifted and is about to. South America, as I said, you've got only two states that have eased, but it does worry us the um, situation in South America because um, if you've read the press, the president is treating COVID-19 with a little bit of disdain. And in the Middle East, we've got um, basically most restrictions being lifted um, after Ramadan. So just to sum that up, once we understand when restrictions are lifted, enables us to understand when the food service sector, when 50% of markets around the world, which are food service, will start to open and we can start planning the future as a result of that. So just a snapshot of, of North America, effectively half of America is lifted and half hasn't and it's a kind of the tale of two cities. Um, and as you know, there are lots of differences between state governors and Donald Trump on the process here. But we won't go into those politics at this point. Here's a critical number. And we've, we've seen in Australia that the um, placements in feedlots have fallen dramatically over the last six to eight weeks. And why that is, is because all those um, middle cut items that I explained, they're going down in value and expensive animals like 100 to 150 day, 200 day animals, Wagyu, they are even more reliant on the food service sector and all those cuts have dramatically fallen in value from high end animals because they rely so heavily on the food service sector that has 
gone into shutdown for the last two months. So as a result, they've had to destock and take animals out of feedlots because they had no place to sell those middle cuts when those animals were ready to be harvested or processed. And ironically, America is doing the same thing at the same time. And placements for the, for the month of March were down to 1994 levels. They were the lowest placements since they started recording placements in 1994. So what does that tell us? We've got a pipeline of grain-fed product that is diminishing fast, both out of North America and Australia. And we are the largest suppliers of grain-fed product globally, these two countries. So that's effectively created a, a, a shortage in the pipeline that's going to appear in the months of September, October, November. And Japan, Korea, and dare I say China, will be looking for beef very, very soon for that period. These numbers are starting to become apparent. And I think next week when we talk about in detail the forecasts, this is a critical part of that forecast, understanding that when the market is wanting to step back in and refill its boots on feeder steers to ensure that it fills that pipeline that is now empty because Australia and the US started to remove cattle out of the system at the same time. I've got by June that Australia's um, animals on feed will be down 30% down to 860,000 head. So these are dramatic numbers, but I believe are very accurate. So it's the same story. This is North America, and it just shows you there with those two bars down the bottom that I've circled, that that is the dramatic fall in placements that's occurred and going to occur over two months with two shoulder months on either side. So. What are the key drivers that will determine price? And this is for next week because we are going to get right into the nitty gritty of month by month forecasting prices out to the end of 2021. So one, when does COVID-19 restrictions lift? Because that will tell us of certain items and certain types of animals when they're going to kick in in terms of demand. When are Australian feedlots looking to fill their yards? Is it going to be June and July as the US shortage becomes apparent to Japan as well as the Australian shortage? When's that supply hole going to appear? It's August to November. Then you've got Chinese New Year, which commences in September for four months. And that too is critical for certain types of animals in Australia, whether it's lamb, whether it's mutton, or whether it's cow. Or steer. And then we look to, as I said at the start of today, that northern wet season kicking in early. What's the impact of that going to be? Then we look at the bounce back effect, and then we look at the impact of, that the IMF is talking about of global growth. So we started this today talking about some crazy predictions that I made, and I thought I'd end with some of those predictions back in November 2018. So looking at cattle cycles, I said back in 2018 in November that come February, March of 2021, that we would see the high in the Australian cattle price of 800 cents per kilo. Next week, we are going to look at that closely, and I'm going to tell you whether that's high or low and where we're going. But I'm hoping I get a reasonable scorecard from our friends in Walker. So to finish up, next week we're going to be looking at month by month pricing for feeder steers, heavy steers, cows, lambs, mutton, and goats. If you've got any specific questions for next week, please send me an email or any of the guys, the organisers for, for today, as I would love to have as many early questions as possible. And with that said, 
I look forward to you um, attending next week. Well, thank you, Simon. There's a lot going on in that space and we appreciate you sharing your insight. We might now move on to some questions and there's a lot of questions being asked, so we might take a, a cross-section of them. I might start by a question asked by Meg and she asked, given the high prices for females slaughtered, what do you think the breeder price will get to in 2020 and 2021? And Heather, please tune in next week for the answer to that question. No worries. I'll move on to another one. And a lot of these are going, I believe you'll cover next week. Um, what are your predictions for live export markets going forward into 2020? As we've already seen a drop of up to 30% in the prices. Yeah, now that is a good question. And I do have some um, forecasts on live cattle. And, you know, it's, it's a tricky market at the best of times. And when you look at the importance of Indonesia and you also understand how bad COVID-19 has been there, the mortality rate right now in Indonesia is 8.8%. It's incredibly high. And I think we've got to accept that COVID-19 and the impact on the market there is probably going to be a lot longer than most other Asian countries. So let's say two to three months that there will be some um, impact on trade. And that includes box beef as well as cattle. But with that said in mind, I think we've got Vietnam, which is playing a critical role in a lot of um, value adding that it's then passing on into China. And with the slowdown in Indian buffalo, because India has been in lockdown now for a month, and that is extended to May 18 and may go longer. No Meatworks has been operating in India now for six weeks. And so you've got this pipeline of product that was going via Vietnam, the grey trade, and they would put in there around about 300,000 tonnes, that that is drying up quickly. So my point is that Vietnam, in terms of live cattle, I can see that market expanding over the next six to 12 months as the problems out of India are preventing that critical grey trade from going through. So what we lose in Indonesia, we may well pick up in Vietnam over the next six to 12 months. That's very interesting, Simon. We might move on to a question from Tony now, and he wants to know your thoughts slash predictions on the likely OTH price of finished stock given the demand disrupt disruptions? Sure. Well, I, I think over, over the hooks prices as well as sale yard prices will be um, one and the same. And dare I say, I'm going to give the same answer for Heather, is we will discuss that next week because whatever trends happen in terms of uh, in the sale yard, the same trends will occur over the hooks. And I'll ask you one from um, Heather again. So should there be good money for grass fat and slaughtered cattle by August, September, or okay, you'll cover that next week as we well? We will be covering that next week as well. I'm starting to sound like a, um, uh, a recorder here, so I apologise. That's okay. We might leave it there, and I'll hand it to Nathan now. Thanks, Simon.